How many of you are asleep? Are you actually just all here? You're just asleep with your eyes open? Is that really what's happening? So you just forgot to leave in the earlier sessions when the coffee break came round? Uh, so my name is Matthew Griffin. Um, a lot of people call me a futurist, and when people call me a futurist, they sort of say, well, futurist, isn't that kind of just wacky? You know, where's your crystal ball? Um, doesn't that mean that, you know, really I should be talking about flying cars and self-driving cars, basically virtual reality and all this kind of stuff, and, and that's pretty much basically where I should end. But um, I started my company around two years ago. Uh, I had, ironically, uh, one of the sponsors wanted to buy me uh, about a year ago until they realized I was a one-man band. Um, and it's been quite a ride. So now I work with companies like Huawei to help them envision the next 20 years of smartphones and the things and the devices that come behind that. Uh, and if you want to understand what the future of the smartphone looks like and the thing that comes behind it, you've got to take away the screen because you're not going to be using a future smartphone if, it, uh, if you don't have an alternative sort of display device. I work with companies like Qualcomm. I sit on the board of a couple of FTSE and Fortune organizations like Centrica. So, for example, Centrica is one of Europe's largest energy organizations, and we're now trying to reinvent the company. Uh, I work with the government of Dubai to help them understand the future of workforce talent, jobs, and skills. So uh, I've just come back from there to help them uh, understand basically how we put together new education systems for the amount of automation that's starting to run at us. Uh, I work with the Google X Prize, so we're going to be putting lunar uh, rovers on the moon next year. So everything from sort of designing super yachts and smartphones to spacecraft, uh, and everything in between, as you'll see. So what I'm going to show you today is, is literally just a couple of what I call sort of grains of Martian dust. And this photo, and I really don't think this photo should be lost on any of you, this is a photo from 56 million miles away, bearing in mind that recently we put a rover onto an asteroid which was 280 million miles away. When we talk about what we can do with technology, we can do some crazy, crazy stuff. And this is one of them. So it's a three minute video, and I'd like your opinion. Wish I could see beyond what I can see. I wish I could touch beyond what I can touch. I wish I could feel beyond what isn't real. I wish I could imagine, imagine, yeah. There's more to who we are. There's more to who we are There's more to what 
So we're going to start running at a fairly rapid clip. Uh, now, if I asked you to rate that video out of 10, how many of you in here would give that below five? How many of you would, oh, let's see, one. There was, a US, there was a US general that actually rated it as a four, so maybe your maybe military stuff. Uh, six, seven, okay, eight, all right, nine, 10, so kind of seven, maybe seven and a half. That's the average sort of result that that gets from every audience, especially I play that too, around the world. Now, you all have seen that as a pop song, right? That was composed and compiled by an artificial intelligent neural network. That was not a pop song created by a human, and that wasn't a human that you just watched. The AI is called Ampner. It's been signed by Sony. You think the artificial intelligence systems, the machine learning and deep learning systems you're embedding into your organizations are state of the art? They're way behind. And that's today. So technology is a rocket ship. When we talk in terms of exponential technology, it is literally a rocket ship. Even the fastest businesses cannot keep up with the pace of technology development. And this gives you all a problem. Whereas regulators, regulators are kind of, uh, you know, when we talk about keeping up with a rocket, shop, rocket ship, uh, the regulators are very much like a, uh, a cyclist, basically, with a puncture. Technology has this interesting effect, basically, on global business and global innovation. If you go and have a conversation with a large multinational organization about the benefits of technology, they will tell you technology is a, multiple, is a, is a, is a force multiplier. It's fantastic. You go and have the same conversation with a startup, they won't talk about it as a force multiplier, they will talk about it as a leveler. Increasingly, every single business that we have on the planet, every single industry that we have on the planet, whether it's workforce, whether it's energy, whether it's computing, whether it's banking, communications, doesn't matter what it is, the cost of each individual transaction continues to drive towards zero. You know, has anyone ever heard, actually, the cost of storage is now at zero? Cost of compute is getting down there. Cost of workforce, what happens when you automate your workforce, which is when we come on, something we'll come on to. This technologies, or these technologies, will undermine the economics of every single one of your businesses. But the problem that you have now with technology is keeping up with it. Because if I went back around 20 to 30 years and I said, well, from a technology standpoint, what do you think you're going to be able to do next year with technology that you couldn't do this year? You might say, well, Moore's law, we're going to have more powerful and cheaper CPUs that might allow us to crunch more data, more powerful networks that allow us to absorb and ingest more information. But today, we don't just have one powerful emerging technology, we have a whole heap of them. And they're all coming at once. You're all now here talking about artificial intelligence and blockchain. But what if I take a quantum computer and I break the encryption on the blockchains that you've just put into your environment? How are you, when quantum computers start coming in in 2021 to 2025, and 2025 is when you'll start being able to actually use them? What does that do to the architecture that you're currently embedding in today into your business? Let alone the security aspects. And then we have all sorts of other bits and bobs, especially that are coming through. Avatars on the customer service front. So how many of you believe in magic? See, no one believes in magic. And there's someone nodding their head there. Yeah. Very, very few people believe in magic any longer. And I think it's actually quite a crying shame, unless you're a child. Yeah. And part of the reason for that is because we typically are looking for the trick. Yeah? If I went back 200 to 300 years ago and I showed them this stage, they'd go, wow, spaceman and everything else. You know, how do we get light to do that? You know, that's crazy. But today, we know that it's technology. We're kind of used to the idea of technology. But these are some of the things that we're doing with it. And again, from a technology perspective, you might not care about some of these things, but they are going to impact how you do business, where you do business, and everything about your industry. No one cares that we created a bacteria recently with six base pair DNA. None of you care about that. But bearing in mind that the future of computing is biological, it's DNA. You know, Microsoft are going to be rolling out DNA storage as a service in their Azure cloud in 2020. You can store all of the information in the internet in a shoebox, basically, if you use this. And that's before we talk about the impact on healthcare. 
Hive Minds, have you ever thought about the fact that if you take a lot of connected devices, you connect them to the cloud, you connect them to a fancy AI, they all learn off each other? It's the definition of a hive mind. Holograms, how many of you have seen holograms in the science fiction movie? Two, three of you, fantastic. Um, it's a, it's, it, I think it's a, it's a sh crying shame uh, that they are still science fiction. Sorry, what I meant to say there was actually science fact. This is the world's first free form living air hologram. There are no glasses involved, there's no glass involved, there's no tricks. And if I don't tell you how this is done, bear in mind there isn't a trick. Do you think it's a magic trick? Because you don't understand how we're doing the trick. This is technology. We're using femto lasers, basically with nanocellulose to create these, by the way. That's how we do the trick. Today, these, they're this big. Tomorrow, they'll be this big. Then they'll get this big, and so on and so on. Holograms are officially a thing. Knowledge uploading. About five years ago, we took, th five years, three years ago, we took uh, 30 pilots uh, in the US. So the, this is with the US DOD and DARPA. We put them into a flight simulator, connected them to skull caps, and we took these F-35s up to 30, 35,000 feet, put them into a flat spin, dropped them. Got the 30 Top Gun pilots to land them, recorded their brain waves. Got 30 volunteers, put them in the same seats as the Top Guns, replayed the brain waves to them, took the F-35s up to 35,000 feet again, dropped them. You can read all about this, by the way, as well. Um, 60% of the people managed to, who'd never ever flown before managed to land an F-35. It's not a basic Cessna. The critics at the time said, yeah, that's fantastic, but the, uh, the effect, you know, mind uploading or you know, information uploading only lasted for 30 minutes. And we went, you missed the flipping point. Molecular assemblers. In the 1960s, we were told that molecular assemblers cannot exist, despite the fact that every single one of you is a molecular assembler. However, at the start of this year, we created, and again, this, these were out of the universities in the US, because that's where a lot of these emerging technologies tend to start in the universities. We created small molecular robots, created a small molecular production line, and created a bunch of molecules. So very, very generation 0.1. Don't get me wrong, you're not going to see these building cars anytime soon. But the things that you think of as science fiction are increasingly science fact. And at some point, these come into your businesses. This comes into manufacturing, for example. Neural streaming, neural streaming. I mean, what if I could read all your minds? Stream it to a TV. Royal Bank of Scotland are using this technology already to vet candidates and identify new talent. So this is already starting to hit the banking industry. Neuroscience at its best. Now here what we're doing is we are reading the mind of an individual in, light, in, in real time. We are taking information from billion, billions of neurons, feeding it through an AI to create these images. Now again, you might look at these images and think, well, hang on, they're basic. But two to three years ago, these images were even worse. Next year, they're a bit better. Year after, they're actually much better. And then we start going on from there. Uh, we actually have studies in the University of Harvard at the moment that will allow you to stream movies from people's brains. Tell me about your holiday. That's all right, I'll just uh, I'll stream it from your mind. Uh, and they're very, very grainy. You know, you're not going to print one out and put it on your wall, but we're unlocking the secrets of the brain. Telepathy. Two years ago, we had a number of people who communicated via telepathy, and if you've read the news recently, how many of you play Tetris? Or oh, used to? Yeah, there we go. You're still using a screen? Ah, old people. Uh, about a week ago, we had three individuals who all played Tetris together telepathically from what University of Washington and Carnegie Mellon University. 
So we are now at the very start of creating the world's first telepathic social network, which, believe me, isn't lost on Mark Zuckerberg, who's uh, recently uh, used, who recently got hold of uh, Regina Duggan from DARPA to uh, help him build, the, uh, to turn Facebook into a social net, into a uh, telepathic social network. Tractor beams. This is where, from a, you know, from a sci-fi perspective, as CEOs and executives, people would be going, yeah, this is all great. I love, I love science fiction stuff. Fantastic. But uh, you're telling me that we can make a tractor beam. But what does that do to my business? Why do I care? You see, if you take, start taking different emerging technologies together and you start combining them, if you take a tractor beam... And they're ultrasound tractor beams, by the way. You can even 3D print one yourself if you really want to. The instructions are on YouTube. Um, something for your kids to play with at the weekend. If you combine a, th a tractor beam with a 3D printer, if you're in the manufacturing industry, someone like Foxconn's CEO, you can do this. You can 3D print your electronic components and bits and bobs and all that kind of stuff. Assemble them use lasers to weld them and all this sort of stuff. And again, very basic, but this stuff gets cheaper, faster, better integrated. You weld it, and in this case, this is the world's first again, you now have a working circuit. So 3D printing is revolutionizing the manufacturing industry. 3D printing plus a tractor beam revolutionizes it again. So if you're a manufa in the manufacturing industry, and I'm talking to you about emerging technology, going, yeah, we know about 3D printing, we're already moving on. But when you speak to CEOs and executives of different boards of Fortune organizations and FTSE organizations, as I have in the past, and you say to them, What's the likelihood that we can come in and we can disrupt your industry? They'll say, not a chance. But increasingly, they're wrong. And they're wrong in every single industry. We're entering what I, term, what I sort of call the techno-Jurassic era. And uh, I found this photo the other day. I think it's actually really apt. Um, this is perhaps your business sitting in the middle, and you're surrounded by startups and different types of technologies. And you're thinking, are these things going to eat me or are they friends? I really have no idea. But in this case, these things look a little bit evil. Yeah. Could be any type of technology organization on the planet, I guess. And you're there going, how the frick do I tame this? How do I get out of here alive? And how do I not just get out of here alive, but how do I thrive? Well, what you need, but as, uh, as uh, Ranjit Basu was saying on the first day, is you need to navigate the next. So if you want to navigate the next, you are doing the things today because that's, that sort of process started a little while ago. But if you want to navigate the next, when it loads up, what you need is a map. And here we go. Here's a map. When you go and have a conversation with analysts, for example, the creative AI that I showed you at the start shouldn't exist either at all or until 2035, according to analysts. I already have creative AIs that are innovating hardware products 10,000 times faster than a human. If you want to go and buy a product that has been created from scratch by an AI, go to Under Armour's store and buy some trainers called Architect for $300. Fly on an Airbus A380. They are partly designed the trainers are fully designed by the AI and then 3D printed. Um, and the Airbus A380 is partially designed by an AI. When you speak to analysts, analysts will inevitably tell you about five to ten technologies. There are 400 emerging technologies that are going to change your world like you wouldn't believe. Every single one of these dots represents a market, addressable market opportunity of around half a trillion dollars. And as you can see, there's a little bit of a lag on this. Um, things like biotech. Oh, there's a big lag on that. There we go. Anyway, uh, we've got everything from, if you have a look at things like machine systems at the top, we've already got, you know, you're getting used to the fact that Silicon and Moore's law is starting to fizzle out. You're starting to get used to the fact that quantum computing is now going to start coming into your business. 
We're already, we have already designed biological computers, chemical computers, DNA computers, and that's before we start getting to some of the more random stuff like liquid computers. We have liquid transistors that will turn a cup of glass basically into a, into a computer. What does that do? Um, when we have a look at materials, self-healing materials, programmable matter, polymers, if you're in the electric car industry and I say to you, I think you should look at polymers, you'll say, go away. See, and I say, but hang on, my polymer will let you charge your electric vehicle in three seconds to full charge. At this point, you're now going, come back. And I'm going, no, you told me to go away, uh, so I'm off. Um, we have drones and all sorts of different robots. We have hardware robots and software robots. Uh, if we have a look in the security space, we have things like DNA encryption and hack-proof code. Hack-proof code is always an interesting concept. It's kind of an IL-5 concept. Uh, DARPA took a new sort of mathematical algorithm, ramped it into a little helicopter, and then set some of the world's best hackers, and they said, take, oh, take control of this helicopter. It's called Whirlybird, a number of years ago. And uh, the hackers couldn't. They said, you can have physical access, virtual access, doesn't matter, off you go. Two weeks later, no one had hacked Whirlybird. High assurance platforms, Morpheus computing platforms. Again, when we talk about the future of computing platforms from a cybersecurity perspective, what happens when you have a computing platform that can reconfigure its hardware dynamically and reconfigure its software dynamically? Not one or the other, but both. It's kind of a Rubik's Cube concept. It's a quite a sort of fun, interesting one. One-time programs, and then we start getting into things like quantum cryptography, basically because all of the crypto that you have, about 70% rather of the crypto that you have in your organizations, that'll be crackable basically in about seven years' time. You need a, you need a quantum computer with about 1,000 qubits to crack all the encryption that you guys use. Are you prepared? User, and then you, down to things like user experience, and we've got a bit, of, a bit of a delay on this, things like natural language and everything else, you know, so we had conversational AI here. If I use conversational AI, and I bake that into something like an Alexa, a self-driving self car, whatever it happens to be, I disrupt you all. I've changed the control point, you're disintermediated. And then this sort of brings us to the question, you know, when we talk about what industry you in, are you in, we start talking about framing, you guys will probably say, we are in the financial services industry. When I say, are you in anything else? It's highly likely you might say, no. When I go and have the same conversation with the technology organizations and go, what industry are you in? Whether it's Baidu, Alibaba, AWS, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Google, whoever it happens to be, they'll say, all of them. We're in healthcare, transportation, basically we're in technology, we're in cloud, we're in banking. So as we start talking about how we frame your businesses, if you want to stay a bank, fantastic. But you are going to be the smartest, leanest bank on the planet. And potentially you're going to be a dumb pipe. And who wants to be a dumb pipe? I was sitting down with the, the CIO of Barclays and Santander and RBS a little while ago. And uh, the, uh, the Barclays guy went, we're really afraid of being a dumb pipe. <coughs> Santander basically said the same thing. In fact, Santander, the, uh, the, the head of global innoventures over at uh, Santander said, my kids don't even see our bank as a brand. Fantastic. Don't, you're not seen as a brand and you're a dumb pipe. That's a fantastic business model. You would like that. Um, so let's start disrupting some, uh, some different industries. Uh, so let's disrupt agriculture because we're always told that we can't disrupt the status quo, so let's disrupt basically a bunch of industries. The thing that's wrong with this particular picture is the cow, for a start. So we have bioreactors now where you can use stem cells from that cow uh, to grow meat. And you can grow turkey and all sorts of things. The FDA has just approved what they call clean meat for consumption in the US, by the way, as well. China has just bought $300 million worth of clean meat uh, from Israel. So we can get rid of animals. We can also produce milk, whey, and all sorts of other uh, dairy products without the need for the cow. Uh, in addition to that, we can take the farm away. We take the farm away, we put it into a vertical farm. So someone talked about the Middle East earlier. Uh, I work with the Middle East. At the moment, they import about 96 to 100% of all their food because they are essentially in a desert. If you take a bioreactor and a vertical farm, you can transform the UAE from a being a net food importer to a net food exporter. 
If you are Kraft or Unilever, you're going, where's our business gone? We used to sell lots of lettuces. Um, however, yeah, if we start combining a couple of, um, if we start combining a couple of different technologies, um, and I'm showing this one because you've all eaten at this particular restaurant. We take our meat that is now no longer from a cow. We automate kitchen staff using robots that have advanced AI and advanced machine vision because these technologies, when you combine them, it's the combination that allows you to do new things. And from a robotic standpoint, machine vision is the thing that is unlocking the power of robotics now. So what we have is we have a fry cook. So this is a robot called Flippy that was uh, rolled out with Ka in Caliburger over in California. And the problem that the human workers had, they had to decommission the robot, human workers couldn't keep up. So they decommissioned it, retrained their staff, and now Caliburger produced lots of burgers really, really quickly and very, very cheaply. But you can automate everything in the back of a fast food kitchen. So the other day I was having conversation with McDonald's about collapsing their food, their global food supply chains into vertical farms and bioreactors and into local neighborhoods which improves their, their environmental and sustainability footprints. Automating their back kitchens, we have automated payments, self-serve at the front, just disrupted the fast food industry. And that's a fairly easy one, to be fair. Um, eventually. Hmm. Energy. So I sit on the Technology and Innovation Committee for Centrica. Um, we all know that the oil prices do this. So on the one hand, renewables basically mean that we can begin getting in, well, we can begin getting to a point where the cost of energy goes to zero. And for non-believers, if I gave you a solar panel and I said, I will install the solar panel for you, and it never needed maintenance, but I say, look, I'll throw in maintenance for you as well, you never, ever have to pay for energy ever again. You can take yourself off the grid. Or you can create a bunch of microgrids, sell that to your neighbors. So I say, hey, look, at the moment, you're buying energy. You're buying energy? That's crazy. Why don't you make money from it instead? So we've now just disrupted the utilities and energy industry. In addition to that, grid-scale storage systems are coming up very, very nicely. Um, we had California recently that uh, decommissioned three coal power stations, and they put in a new virtual power plant, uh, which uses renewables combined with microgrids and blockchain. Uh, and they then used a bunch of batteries. So we, uh, we now have examples where organizations are decommissioning power plants. And, so, and quite a lot of the European energy um, guys are actually selling their generating capabilities. You're changing your business. And you consume this. If you're a manufacturing organization and I say, look, the, your price of energy is going to do this for the next 20 years because you're buying from oil, or it can do this. As a manufacturing organization or as a heavy user of electricity, suddenly you have consistent pricing. Communications. Uh, this year with SpaceX, we're throwing 4,200 satellites into low Earth orbit. Um, so Disney should love this. If you're in the entertainment industry, if you like having connected customers, you should like this. Today, about 50% of the world is connected. You throw these birds into the air, you can cover every single square centimeter of Earth with LTE, 4G, Wi-Fi, and everything else. We connect the last three and a half billion people on the planet. So if you're a digital business, and you want to be able to sell to your customers who are connected, today, your maximum addressable market opportunity is three and a half billion people if you've got them all. Within the next 10 years, Potentially, if everybody buys a smartphone and if everyone buys a router and getting the router is just a business model, we give them away for free, all of a sudden, your customer base could now be 7 billion. Construction. Out in the UAE, but we are now talking about fully autonomous construction sites. Again, at a basic level, you use drones, fully autonomous vehicles, geospatial mapping and all sorts of other sort of neat, neat tips and tricks and you now have fully autonomous construction. We're also talking, in fact, we're not talking, we're doing, uh, we're going to be 3D printing an 80-story skyscraper in 2021. Construction is changing. Today, we go and build houses out of brick. 
But now, companies like the US Marines, California, Ukraine, there's lots of these guys about. By 2030, the Dubai government want 25% of all new houses and homes to be 3D printed. If you're in the construction industry, how does that change your point of view on the world? If you're a regulator, how do you regulate that? And I work with a bunch of regulators, so we know the answer. Entertainment. Increasingly, we have the rise of virtual entertainers, like the one I showed you before. But in addition to that, we now have the rise of virtual bloggers. So, you know, we have lots of kids basically going onto YouTube, showing off makeup and clothes and all that kind of stuff. Even that is being disrupted now by virtual bloggers called, sort of, there's one called Little Michaela. Um, and the fashion industry loves her because they go to the people who've created these sort of virtual avatars and they say, we've got these types of clothes. I'd like a woman that looks like this, you know, with this size, this shape, basically this skin color, this hair color, whatever it happens to be. And the creators just go, yeah, that's fine, tweaked, done. I don't have to deal with models any longer. Good thing or bad thing, not sure, but hey ho. Autonomous companies, when we have a look at the financial services space, um, the world's first fully autonomous organization uh, emerged in Hong Kong about two years ago. They're called ADA, they're a hedge fund. They have no people. They are fully autonomous. If you guys have heard of companies like Bridgewater Associates, Bridgewater Associates have $160 billion under management. Uh, they are now automating their entire company. And that, in that particular world, they have 1,500 people, and the CEO, because it's a private organization, uh, wants to automate the entire organization. And there's lots of other examples of that as well. So if we now start looking at fully autonomous companies, creative AIs, blockchain, and all these other bits and pieces, robotic process automation, are your future computers, are, are your future competitors going to be organizations like, say, for example, Starling Bank that we heard from the other day, fully digital banks? Or is it going to be fully automated digital banks? And we're already seeing the rise of these. Robo-regulators, I've heard a lot today about uh, regulations. Uh, I work with a number of the regulators, and uh, they actually like this. Uh, we're starting to create early proof of concepts for robo-regulators. So if you're a fintech and you are the FCA over in the UK, uh, we're now looking into creating robo-regulators. Right. So all of a sudden, regulation is automated. Now, not all of it. You know, let's face it, there's always more regulations. There's always more compliance basically that you need to look at. However, if we have a robo-regulator, we can now do something um, called banking on rails. So there's an organization in the UK called Rails Bank. What they do is they take all those digital all those regulations, digitize them, and they create essentially what's a rail. So with companies like Rails Bank, you can get, as a fintech, you can get access to global banking with just five, with five lines of code. Because one of the biggest problems that we actually have as businesses is on the one hand, a lot of the innovation occurs outside of your industry or in close proximity to your business. Um, but as a startup, like the guys who are on stage here, they're going, you know what, we solve some really great problems and we do it in a really innovative way. But you guys, we want to deal with you guys because you've got scale, because I plug my thing into Barclays and all of a sudden I have access to 30 million customers. What starts happening when you combine a fully autonomous organization that can create itself, iterate itself, operate itself, scale itself, stick banking on rails? Um, how do you cope with that when you're now just starting to get to the point where you're going, we're, we're partially digitized. You've got, and bringing on that front, basically you need to be digital because you need to be digital, but you need to have a view of some of this stuff because does that affect how you're building your businesses and architecting your platforms? Cryptocurrencies, do we need a bank? Do we need a bank anyway? Peer-to-peer -peer in Africa, basically in Africa I do a lot of work. Um, they don't have things like the faster payments in infrastructure and all that kind of stuff. Do we need a bank? Why can't, and even if we do, why can't we ask these questions? And a lot of entrepreneurs and people are asking these questions. Why do we need company X, Y, and Z? Compromised. Okay. So one of the things that some of the organizations here have been doing this week is talking about uh, cybersecurity. I work with the NCSC, uh, the UK government, the US DOD, and I also work with GCHQ. Today, 
you have some of the best security probably on the planet, simply because you have had to be, have organizations that have been designed with security in mind for decades. But what happens when I start throwing robo-hackers at your organizations? These robo-hackers are already in the wild. They operate 100 million times faster than the human hackers that you're used to. They will scan 40 million lines of code, and there are platforms called Mayhem and all this sort of other thing. They will scan 40 million lines of code, identify zero-day exploits and general exploits, especially in your code, within about 30 seconds to two minutes, called proof of vulnerabilities. And uh, you can see these things and uh, hack you. How do you come and combat that? These are so great that the US DOD and the Pentagon have now put these things into their mission critical infrastructure to protect against Russian, Russian and uh, Chinese attacks. Plus, when we start having a look at where artificial intelligence is today, AI is already able to self-design, self-code, self-replicate. So we now have, about six months ago, we saw the first evolving malware. And by the end of this year, it's going to be better and better and better. So you think the security of your organizations is actually good? It's up to snuff? There's a very, very easy way to use these things to take out critical national infrastructure. And that's with the best brains in the business. Unbanked. You know, if you have a look, basically, at around 2 billion people on the planet, they have no way to prove who they are. So this is where we now talk about sovereign ID schemes and everything else. Now, Facebook keeps trying to be the single sort of version of the truth when it comes to identity. But why? If you think about your business models, your business models are actually predicated on trust, not just trust with each other, but trust with your consumers. Where are your sovereign ID systems? Where are the executives within your organization saying, you know what, why don't we build sovereign ID systems so we become not just EKYC, e but we become the person's online identity. There's a market there for seven billion people. And then as I say, as banks, if you see yourselves as banks, and it's not just you guys, I have conversations basically with lots of different industries. I have conversations in the transportation industry. And there was one recently, they do 1.2 billion journeys a year. And I said, what are you? They said, we're a transportation company, we're a rail and bus company. And go, that's fantastic. So as we see mobility as a service rise, feel free to stay as a bus and, you know, a, a bus and train company, but Toyota aren't looking at themselves going, we're a car company. They're going, we are in the mobility business. We just use trains and buses and cars and different sort of platforms and bits and bobs. It's probably time to reframe your organization because digital allows you to destroy the boundaries between individual businesses, but also individual industries. So once you have your digital house in order, why can't you go after other industries? It's exactly what the technology guys are doing. And they're doing it very well. They've got a head start. When we talk about government, you know, we're, talk we're now digital is changing government. We're increasingly seeing the rise by of new nations that are born in cyberspace. Estonia is now a virtual nation that can reboot itself. So as a business, is the rise of virtual nations an opportunity? The US government, the US military thinks these guys are a threat. But um, increasingly, we're seeing e-residency and e-company programs, especially with a variety of different countries around the world, that say, we have 1.3 million citizens. If we become a virtual nation, we could have lots more. And then we could have more money, more, more, money, more tax, basically, coming into our country. Healthcare in your hands. How many of you want to disrupt healthcare? Shall I show you how to disrupt healthcare, basically, with a $50 smartphone and a piece of AI, a, and a camera and a little couple of sensors? Yeah? Yeah, all right. It's a $3 trillion industry, okay? So, we've done this. So, if I look like I'm taking a selfie of my uh, arm, and you say, well, what are you doing? I can say, well, I'm checking myself for skin cancer. All these are more accurate than doctors. I can roll them out to one billion people that don't have access to primary health care. If I look like I'm taking a selfie, and you say, look, Matt, what are you doing? I say, well, I'm checking myself for pancreatic cancer. Because when you have pancreatic cancer, the cameras in these things can pick up that you've got slightly yellow eyes and flushed skin. <coughs> if I do that, 
I knock out the microphone. But you say, well, what are you doing now? I say, well, I'm checking myself for fatal heart disease. Because the accelerometer in here, combined with AI, is now with a 98% accuracy able to detect whether I have arterial defib. If I do this and speak into the phone, you go, what are you doing now? I say, well, I'm checking myself for dementia. Because we're using the microphones in these things, again, combined with AI, to figure out whether people have dementia. Because when you get dementia, you start stuttering and your voice changes and all sorts of things. So what I can do is, as a startup, I can take all of these things and more, put them into a smartphone, and then my only problem is how do I scale it? And from my perspective, we're doing this, so we're doing it with a couple of the smartphone companies, and instantly we get half access, access to half a million people who have no form of access to primary health care. I'm changing your business. Fully autonomous retailers. Amazon basically have created a creative AI that designs clothes, puts it on a website, you like those clothes, you go and buy, it's fulfilled on demand using an on demand, an on -demand manufacturing system they have back at the store that just takes a load of fabric, ships it autonomously, so picks it and ships it autonomously. They get rid of all their inventory. Amazon's profits in the fabric space will do that over the next 10 years. This will probably be rolled out in about 2019, but when you have a look at all the patents, and there's more detail to this, when you have a look at all the patents, they have everything they need to be the world's first fully autonomous retailer. And it's not lost on companies like Nike, Adidas, or anyone else who are already 3D printing shoes in the back. So we're starting to collapse supply chains. If Adidas no longer need to order 10 million shoes from China because they're 3D printing them in the back of their, in the back of their shops, if you're Maersk, the transportation company, or Costco, and you go, to a, you go to Adidas and go, why aren't we shipping any of your stuff any longer? That's because we're printing them now. So there's, connected, there's, there's implications of all of these. And then Uber. Why don't we disrupt Uber? Uber, king of disruption. So I take my fully autonomous model from the financial services industry Bear in mind that Uber is a really great transaction platform. Why can't I automate Uber? And if I automate Uber, and maybe Lyft does it or someone else, if I automate Uber, do I disrupt Uber? Who disrupted the transportation industry? I have the tech today. And then how many of you drive? As we start wrapping up. Yeah, one of you drives, fantastic. Um, have you ever thought of this, especially with the, with the advent of self-driving cars, if I take away the pedals in your car, the dashboard, uh, and, um, and the brake pedal, are you in a car, or are you in a pod? You're in a pod. And this isn't lost on companies like Audi and Toyota, who are now literally talking about the death of the car. Because if you get into a pod, so from Audi's perspective, they are now already saying, in the future, we will not sell cars. We will sell pods as a service, mobility as a service, all that kind of thing. What happens to them, their go-to-market model, their business model, their supply chains, their manufacturing processes? You know, increasingly, Mercedes uh, are also becoming a, a, a content company. But this is where we can, can now start doing some interesting things, because you, you know that Mercedes sell cars, right? Yeah. You know that they're an energy company as well, right? Of course they're an energy company. They produce an electric vehicle. The batteries in the electric vehicle decharge and need removing. But those batteries have still got life in them, about 80% of their life. You take those batteries, you put them into a bunker basically outside of Dusseldorf, they're now powering the, the electricity grid. Mercedes is an energy company. So if you're working for Centrica, EDF, RWE, and everything else, and someone goes, Mercedes has just moved into uh, energy, you go, really? Go away. And they go, no, look, here's a photo, look, I can take you around their data, I can take you around the old data center. Supplying energy, peak energy to the, grid, to the German grid. Ooh, didn't see that coming. And you can buy it via the blockchain and all that kind of stuff. Um, however, you know, as we start talking about disrupting the transportation industry, 
uh, we might as well start talking about uh, disrupting air travel. So why not? This is coming 2024. It's already been flight tested 300 times. So as we talk about navigating to the next, you now have a map. The journey and what type of journey you have is now down to you. So thank you very much. My name is Matthew Griffin and you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you.